Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished up talking about the idea of Bronny entering the NBA draft and transfer portal. And now on the note of the NBA, we're going to be getting into some of the games from last night. The one that I want to start with is the one between the Miami Heat and Philadelphia 76ers, where two teams here sitting as the seven and eight seeds in the Eastern Conference, both trying to make a little bit of a push here to towards the end of the season, trying to escape the play-in threshold. As things currently stand, Indiana holds the six seed currently. And as I briefly check here, Indy's got a half game lead on the Heat, a one game lead on the 76ers. So it is still in the realm of possibility through these last handful of games that they could work their way out. And really, I want to talk about, well, we're going to get into Joel Embiid in his second game back, but as far as this game in particular, very back and forth throughout, Sixers came out hot, but the Heat just kept it in reach for the entire game, and they went on a 13-0 run from the end of the third quarter into the early fourth where they took the lead. And then from there, sort of the big picture issue with the Heat is their offense can just get so stagnant. They went from 819 left in the fourth quarter until there were 45 seconds left in the game to hit a field goal. It came off of a very tough shot as well of Terry Rozier hitting a step back fading three. So offense was just not easy for Miami in this game. And runs like this are why I do still refuse to believe the narrative that the Heat are better without Tyler Hero. I know that his stock has been all over the place since coming into the league, but he is at the bare minimum somebody who can create a shot for himself. And that's just something that the Heat are missing as their offense has been really struggling, especially as of late. And, you know, they're, the Heat yesterday closed out this game with the likes of Haywood Highsmith and Caleb Martin down the stretch, who are both two very solid players. Not that I want to get on their case necessarily, especially because as a Celtics fan, especially with Caleb Martin, I know that the dam I know of the damage that he can do, but just not players that are really going to initiate offense whatsoever. And it's very reliant on Terry Rozier, who has been playing very well as of late too. Somebody that definitely can be scary in the playoffs. It also comes down to the conversation around Jimmy Butler, where obviously we know playoff Jimmy, you know, when he comes alive, he puts on his superhero cape and he takes over. But are we sure that Jimmy Butler is still at that same level of athleticism? And I say this and I know that it could very easily come back to hurt me that, you know, this could be held over me. But ultimately with Jimmy here, we've seen he's 34 years old now and he's been playing pretty much less and less games over the year. And you know what? He doesn't care about the regular season. He never has, which I mean to some degree, all power to him because he shows up in the postseason. But in order to pull off a, you know, these types of upsets that it took last from last season, at least, he's going to need to hit a level that we haven't seen from him in just about a year now. And I just feel like it is sort of a big ask to put it all on him. Now, like I mentioned, Tyler Hero maybe adds a level of dynamicism to their to their offense. Is dynamicism a word? Whatever, though. But he adds an element to their game that they currently don't have. A lot of the times when their offense was really getting going during this game against Philly, it came off of big-time defensive plays. It was during the second quarter, I believe, where they were throwing some full court pressure, causing the Sixers to turn the ball over, and they were getting themselves a bunch of easy looks in this game. But I thought it was a real concern for the Heat, who again, year after year, they're sort of this sleeper team. Still definitely possible, but there are some real concerns 
that are sticking out with the Heat as things currently stand. But on the Sixers side of this, I was very impressed with the stretch that Philly played without Joel Embiid in the fourth quarter. He was checked out from 7.30 to 3.30, just about. And Philly was down six when he left the game. By the time he came back, they were up by one. And it was in large part due to Tyrese Maxey, of course, who was tremendous in this game, scored 37 points, came just one rebound shy of a triple-double. But Kelly Oubre has also been playing some really good minutes for Philly lately on both ends of the floor. And I just talked about him the other day as well. Sometimes he's this irrational confidence guy that that goes the no no yes shots where he's just he's fearless and I feel like the Nick Nurse has really taken a liking to him. Last night he played 41 minutes in the game tied with Tyrese Maxey for the most by any 76er and it was really impressive I thought the way that Philly was able to hold themselves together when Embiid checked out around that 730 mark he was at 29 minutes that was the same number of minutes he played in his first game when the 76ers had him return against the Oklahoma City Thunder earlier this week but they they end up bringing him back and he wasn't all ultimately you know the number one impact guy it was a lot of Tyrese Maxey down the stretch but again, I think that that's almost more of a positive for Philly than anything if you look at it from a certain angle that the 76ers are, you know, they looked so terrible, obviously, in those months where Embiid was out. And he's still a big deal, even when he's not doing the scoring, his presence alone is a difference maker for this Philadelphia team. But ultimately, when you look at the you know, situation of all of this, they don't seem to need the 35 points per game version of Embiid that we were seeing in the first half of this season. But diving into how Embiid looked in this game in particular, he came out hot 21 points in the first half, but definitely again in the second half of this game, sort of similar to what we saw against the Thunder earlier this week was that conditioning is definitely an issue with him right now. He ended up scoring eight points in the third quarter and then went scoreless in the fourth, was three of nine from the field in the second half as a whole, and just didn't look all that aggressive. Now, to be fair, the Heat were running their zone coverage, and when Embiid was getting the ball at the free throw line, he had multiple defenders in his space, so... He, at least this time, passing out of these types of double teams, didn't have the six turnovers that he had against Oklahoma City. And also, to his credit, Bam Adebayo is a very tough defender to try and work through, and it seemed like Embiid just didn't really have any interest in pushing it from that perspective. But he's very clearly still working himself into shape here. Like I talked about the other day, you know, it's obviously better for the 76ers if they can steal that six seed and avoid the play-in tournament. But the number one thing for him here is just making sure that he's as healthy as possible headed into these playoffs and having him push himself to the limits in a regular season game that, yes, again, obviously nice to have this type of a win, but it is not the end-all be-all for their season. And I'm just curious whether or not we're going to be able to see the full version of him. They have five games left in the season. How much is going to change from now to then? We're just outside two weeks from the official start of the playoffs. Play-in tournaments start on the 17th, I believe. So I'm going to need to see a lot of improvement necessarily if they want to compete with Boston or Milwaukee again not that I think that either of those teams are unbeatable especially the Bucks and the 76ers can be a tough matchup but it's just going to be very interesting to see what version of Embiid we get down the stretch of the season I also wanted to touch on the Rockets Warriors last night where 
Of course, it was a storyline for a bit there, how the Rockets had won 10 straight games and they were making a push at the Warriors for that final play-in spot. They played a couple games this past week that sort of looked like it was going to kill their chances of that. They lost to the Mavericks and Timberwolves headed into this game, and ultimately the Warriors just took it to them in this one. Really wasn't all that close, and now it's a four-game difference between the Warriors and the Rockets, and it seems like the Rockets' season is sort of just about over. I do want to give them credit for the way that they were able to play down the stretch of this season. Very impressive, and there's a lot to build on there, but... The youth is absolutely a big time thing with them. You look at their away record this season, 9 and 28. That's just not good enough to be a postseason team. And if they had even made the play in tournament, they were going to have to go into the likes of possibly in LA. Um, and it just didn't seem like they were necessarily in a good position, regardless. But. That being said, this season wasn't supposed to be their year making the playoffs, and they took a lot of strides in the right direction, really correcting their defense under their new head coach, Ime Udoka. So good for them on that. Elsewhere in the league last night, I guess I would also just sort of point to the Nuggets-Clippers game that took place late last night. It was a primetime game on TNT. There was no Kawhi, no Jamal Murray. So no Kawhi, I guess it sort of takes away from the point I'm about to make, but this was a little bit looking like a get-right game where it's a shorthanded Nuggets team. We've seen how different that they've looked without Jamal Murray in this recent stretch. I believe he missed his seventh straight game possibly last night um, dealing with an injury. But again, I feel like it's more precautionary than anything, but... James Harden had been going through a big time slump headed into this game and the Clippers do win it ends up being a close one they win 102 to 100 this was a really weird game now on the Harden note he got himself going in the second quarter showed some flashes of promise there but still finished the night just 6 of 23 from the field 2 of 13 from 3 that still is not looking great and this is you know, a situation this year in L.A. where playoff Harden is absolutely a narrative that has sort of surrounded him for a handful of years now, which is to some level fair. But when you look at where Philly was last year with Harden, they were really reliant on him in that role, assuming that the Clippers are fully healthy, which, you know, still is never necessarily a given with them. Harden is the third option for them, so still not necessarily, you know, quite as reliant on Harden to be the go-to guy in the playoffs, and they can overcome to some level them being a, you know, him not performing at the level that maybe hope from him. But this is still a team that headed into last night was 500 over their last 24 or so games and defensively since the all-star break have looked really bad and again no Kawhi in this game so it's hard to say this was a total get right game for LA but it did feel like it was that going to be that way a little bit now Paul George was excellent in this one he seems to sort of be coming into his own. They had that game against the 76ers a couple weeks ago where he was he started out in the first half really struggling, but then down the stretch of that game, making plays on both ends, I do feel like he's still one of the more underappreciated players of, you can make an argument, his generation. Um, I've always been a big fan of Paul George going back to his days in Indy prior to that injury, but, you know... Like I said, this was a very weird game where the refs were pretty bad on both ends. Uh, Mike Malone ended up getting tossed because of some of the officiating that had him with a hot head. And it was clear that they were missing both Malone and Jamal Murray at the end where the Nuggets got a stop on defense with about eight seconds left and they clearly had very little idea what they were doing. Peyton Watson grabbed the rebound. He started just dribbling the ball up the court and like slowly dribbling the ball up the court, then passed it to Jokic. Um, their assistant, Adelman, I believe his name is, 
He ends up calling a timeout, but they burn three seconds there because of the fact that they dribbled the ball up the court the way that they did. They couldn't get the ball advanced to the half court, and ultimately Jokic had to just chuck up a ridiculous shot, which granted, we've seen him make some crazy shots in the past, but just not a good look whatsoever. But again, for the Nuggets, doesn't really matter. It was just clear they were missing their head coach and their star ball handler, but not a super convincing game from LA still. And again, I know I keep saying it, no Kawhi makes a difference here, but was just hoping to see a higher level of performance, I think. Specifically, you got to look at that Harden situation and be at least a little bit concerned about it. But that is all we have time for on this subject. We're going to be taking our final break. And when we come back on the other end, going to be sort of giving some final details here on the Stefan Diggs deal as that was one of the biggest headlines of the week, of course. And we have some details that have come out over the past 24 hours. So stick with us and we will be right back. <laughs> 